of Speaking, a monthly podcast on the spoken word, episode 11, December 2018, Idiolects, a conversation with Amy Stoller. Hello, Paul Meyer here with my latest podcast, a service of Paul Meyer Dialect Services at paulmeyer.com, where you'll find all my books, ebooks, and services for spoken word training and coaching. I've been finishing up my dialect instruction recordings for One Man, Two Governors. Richard Beans, hugely popular comedy based on the 1743 Commedia dell'arte style classic The Servant of Two Masters by Carlo Goldoni. One Man, Two Governors is set among England's colourful criminal underworld in the early 1960s. Lots of good old-fashioned Cockney accents, a couple of rather posh RP characters, that's received pronunciation, as Amy and I will talk about shortly, and one Jamaican character. It was a wonderfully enjoyable project, as London in the early 60s was my own time and place. My recordings are now available to any company producing that play, along with a free copy of the appropriate dialect instruction ebook for each actor. See Dialect Recordings for Plays and Musicals on the menu bar of paulmeyer.com for all the details. Twenty years ago, I founded the International Dialects of English Archive, IDEA, and have been its director ever since. IDEA at dialectsarchive.com contains well over 1,400 recordings of what we might call real-life dialect and accent speakers from all over the world. For my own work as a dialect coach, and for many dialect coaches like my guest Amy Stoller, IDEA underpins our research as we design dialects for plays, films, television and new media. If you haven't explored IDEA yet, you're in for a treat. So many interesting stories and dialects to hear. Amy Stoller, as well as being one of IDEA's valued associate editors, is the sole proprietor of the Stoller System, based in New York City. She's one of the top dialect coaches in the city. As resident dialect designer and frequent dramaturge at Off-Broadway's award-winning Mint Theatre Company, she's helped actors suit the word to the action, as Hamlet put it, for more than 20 years. Since 2007, she's been Anna Devere Smith's dialect coach on projects such as Notes from the Field and Let Me Down Easy, among others. Her most recent screen credit is AMC's Dietland, and her other film and television work ranges from Selma to Dora the Explorer. Amy's articles have appeared in Voice and Speech Review, the official journal of the Voice and Speech Trainers Association, VASTA, which she also ably serves as an officer. Go to stolarsystem.com to learn more about her. We've been colleagues for nearly 30 years. Amy, it's so good of you to take the time out of your busy schedule to join me today. So thanks so much for being with me. It's my pleasure. What would you be doing if you weren't talking to me right now? I would be doing dramaturgical research for my next project at the Mint Theatre Company, an English play called The Price of Thomas Scott, which to the best of my knowledge has never been done in the United States. A premiere, a U.S. premiere. Of a 1913 play. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we're going to talk about idiolects, which, of course, we run up against all the time, the concept that people actually have their own distinct personal way of talking. What does the term mean to you, Amy? Well, I don't have a better definition than the one you just gave. I'm very fond of Doug Honorov's, which I believe is a service mark. He calls idiolects the snowflakes of dialects, Hmm. which is a wonderful image for getting the point across of just how individual this is. Indeed. So just for our listeners who may have never come across, it's idiolect just like idiosyncrasy, and it means pretty much the same thing, something peculiar to an individual. This time it's a dialect personal to an individual, right? That's correct. So how is it the brothers and sisters growing up with the same dialectal influences, going to the same schools, having the same mum and dad, 
How do we end up speaking rather differently from our siblings? What do you think is the cause of all that diversion from the same dialect? Well, I think it's because we are indeed individual people. And the things that influence our speech patterns are many and varied. Yes, things like growing up in the same city, growing up with the same parents, growing up with roughly the same peer group can make a difference. So can things like era, generation. Not all brothers and sisters are close in age. Mm -hmm. And not all siblings have the same interests. Some people want to be identified closely with the city of their birth. Other people want to sound as different as possible from that. Some people are in more sympathy with one parent or the other. And if the parents have very different speech patterns, you may hear that reflected in the speech of two or more siblings. So I I don't – this is why I never play the Henry Higgins game. Yeah. I'm not going to pinpoint where someone is from down to the street in Listen Grove <laughs> because I don't I don't know what all the influences are on somebody's speech. We are the sum of all our influences as speakers and all of our thoughts and feelings. Speech as you know is very bound up in identity and even identical twins don't have the same identity. These are good points. These are great points. I identified strongly with my mother, who had very strong aspirations for us to all speak BBC English, even though we were working class types, you know. And um, so I sort of acquiesced to my mother's uh, aspirations for the family, which was to be more middle class. And um, But my, my brother, you know, he, he was much more of an egalitarian. And um, his value system certainly reflected that in his accent. You know, he's much more London sound than than my mother would have us be. So who we want to be, who we want to project to the world comes into this. And isn't this fascinating? Do you think we do enough of acknowledging the richness of idiolects when we coach actors? I'm always keen to avoid what I call cookie cutter accents so that everybody in Steel Magnolias ex sounds exactly the same. And there's too little, in my opinion, too little acknowledgement and reflection of the tremendous variety uh, within peer groups. I probably started with, if not cookie cutter, a very strong template for the first uh, shows that I coached mm -hmm. so that everybody who spoke RP spoke the same RP, or I tried to get them to do that. I think we have to acknowledge that since all actors are different, we're never going to achieve absolute uniformity. The result is going to be an idiolect no matter what we do. This is a good point. Because we have different speakers. But very quickly I became interested in differentiating, let's take English plays for an example, because they're very easy to illustrate because we have both class-based and regional-based differences you can be very specific about era up to a point. I have a whole collection of pronouncing dictionaries, starting with Daniel Jones's first one from 1917, and I can track differences in what constituted RP pronunciation of words through the decades. You know, when was it controversy, and when was it controversy, and when was it controversy, and how much more do we get the down marketing of RP even as a concept so that what is often described as RP today is not something I recognize as RP? That's received pronunciation for those of you who don't know what RP stands for. Received by the largest number of listeners, right, in Daniel Jones's idea, right? Well, I think it, it tends to be understood as received by those who are in a position to make decisions about what is acceptable and what is not. I think that received pronunciation, which Jones originally called public school pronunciation, is actually a class-based descriptor. And again, for the benefit of our American listeners, public school actually means private school. 
and usually a very elitist private school, mm-hmm. although they didn't start out that way. But that's a topic for another podcast. Indeed. So if there's all this fantastic information about a person's aspirations, their identity, uh, the circumstances of their lives, if there's all of this fantastic sort of dramaturgical information encoded and embedded in a character's idiolect, why do we not spend less time on the cosmetic authenticity, so-called authenticity of a of an actor's accent, and more time on what can be dramatically revealed about the character? What kind of information from a narrative storytelling point of view we can glean from an idiolect? Or perhaps, perhaps you already do. Perhaps well, you I already think do I, that. I think I do. Um, I also think that I began to do it without thinking about it as part of my growth as a dialect coach or dialect designer. And in fact, I use the word designer very deliberately. Yes, I do too. I'm making, I'm making very specific choices about an accent palette for a production or accent choices for a character. The dialect, as distinct from accent, is chosen by the writer. So unless I am actually working with a writer who is in the room and who is willing to collaborate in terms of adjusting lines to a character's speech pattern, let's say a character's given circumstances, I don't have a lot of control over that. No. And, and of course, the, the textbooks would tell us that a dialect comprises not only the accent, but all of those other features, the vocabulary, the syntax. Uh, the, the grammar. The grammar. The grammar. Though as dialect coaches, that distinction sort of blurs, doesn't it? I mean, we are mostly accent coaches, but we call ourselves dialect coaches. Or perhaps you call yourself an accent coach. I don't know. I normally call myself a dialect designer, and I think of my work as being involved in dialect because you can't avoid dialect. It's whatever is on the page that the actor is given to speak, Mm -hmm. unless you're working with someone who's going to do improv, And then you have a great deal more latitude in terms of shaping their understanding of how the dialect works so that they can make informed choices. Mm -hmm. I'm helping actors not only to understand how to pronounce things, but how to understand what it is they're saying and why they're saying it the way they're saying it. To understand the idioms, to understand the, the resonances and the connotations of the words that have been chosen, yes. All the underlying understandings that the writer and perhaps since in many cases I work on very old plays that the the original audience would have had. Isn't this a fantastic line of work? So my interview with Backstage tomorrow, Mm -hmm. the industry journal, the industry paper, is going to be on the question of respecting and honoring individual uh, and ethnic dialects, which we have better tools for now than we did, and we have b- better awareness than we did 10 and 20, 30 years ago. So I wonder what what your opinion is of the, of the changes in respect and honor that we bring to dialect work. Well, I think respect is a key word for me, and it's something that I've always had an interest in. So I welcome the new technology. I welcome the repositories of genuine accent and dialect samples, such as idea. And I take advantage of everything I can get. But to be honest, I don't think I personally know any accent and dialect coaches who don't aspire to this. I think that very often, if we don't achieve our goal, it's because of things that are beyond our control. Exactly. Did you ever do any dialect forensics? Were you ever hired to uh, tell the person what you can glean from the pronunciation or the grammar or the language, the dialect? I would never take on that work. It's a too great a responsibility for me. I don't want to be in a courtroom being interviewed as an expert on something like that. Uh, there are too many variables and there's time pressure, and I don't feel it's my place to make judgments of that kind that could affect somebody else's life. I work in the performing arts, and I stick to my last. <laughs> well said, well said. I have a, 
I've been approached two or three times in my life for for help in that once by the police department and fortunately my opinion that I rendered on the recording that they offered me turned out to be uncrucial in the case and uh, the case broke open in a different direction and didn't rely upon my opinion of whether the person on this recording was genuine in their Caribbean accent or faking it. <laughs> but that was the, that was the interesting uh, challenge that I was thrown by the, by the homicide division. Well, the closest I ever got to that was advising the writers of an episode of Law & Order SVU on Honduranismos, uh, Honduran, but it was Honduran Spanish, idioms and phraseology that were very, very specific to the Honduras. And this became a critical clue in identifying a special victim. But this is, now we're talking, of course, about a language, or if you prefer a dialect, but we're not talking about idiolect. In fact, I, I had a question prepared for you. Clearly, we recognize and encounter idiolects uh, in native speakers, M me and my brother, my brother and I, as I should say. But when we encounter second language speakers in English who have a strong overlay of, of, the, of the accent of their first language, do we get less of the native speaker idiolect information from foreign accent speakers in plays, do you think? Is the... Are uh, the subtle differences between one speaker and another, the personal information that we get, are they overshadowed somehow by the foreign accent? I think these are things that can only be judged by the members of the audience. I can't control what people receive. I can only control what I work on. I know what my intention is. I know the amount of work I put into achieving uh, an accurate, authentic, idiolect performance in collaboration with a performer or a set of performers. And it's a prodigious amount of work. I guess but what the audience is going to receive from it, like everything else a performer does, is not within my control. I guess what I'm getting at is that when we're asked to coach a French accent or a German accent, often... You know, that's what we get. We get this cosmetic overlay of, of a German accent, but we, but we lack the speaker to speaker differences, the, the, and the information about their aspiration to acquire English, their devotion to their own native German or French or whatever it is. The same factors that we spoke about when we started speaking about idiolect. Somehow it's it seems to me that the foreign language accent trumps that subtle and coded information. I don't think it does necessarily. After all, we know that there are many influences on people who are speaking English as a second language. And if we're dealing with their accent in English, then we're dealing with how old were they when they learned English? Did they learn English from a native speaker? Mm -hmm. What type of English did they learn? Yeah. How much? How much do they want to hold on? And so forth. I, I personally feel very strongly that these are all the things we should be considering no matter what we do. Okay. So you, that goes into your design. Those considerations. It absolutely you, goes into my design if I'm working on a production. Let's bracket idiolects with code switching and accommodation, which I think all play into each other in a certain way. What's your understanding of code switching and, and what's your observation about it? Well, it started out as a linguistic term, of course. It had to do with people who were bi or multilingual, and they would code switch when they switched from one language to another. It has since had a broadened definition that has to do with the way anybody speaks, even in only one language, depending on where they are, who they're speaking to, the level of formality or informality of the circumstances, things like that. I know that when I speak to my mother, I sound more like my mother. And when I speak to my father, I sound more like my father. Mm -hmm. I don't do it on purpose. I become aware that that's what I'm doing. And in fact, if I tried to do it on purpose, I would wildly overstep the mark. <laughs> I can't do it on purpose, but I can become aware that this is what I'm doing. So would it be fair to say that uh, that level of code switching is very much what uh, linguists call accommodation, tuning in to... The, the tempo of the person you're with whom you like and and uh, out of deference for that uh, that affection 
each of you starts to sound a little bit like each other. It may be out of affection. What if it's just because I have a good ear and I can't help picking up things that are being modeled to me? In the case of my parents, yes, of course, there's affection. But but again, there's always more to know about these things. Yeah. L- linguists make the observation from from experiments that the greater the affection, the greater the accommodation, and the, the less affection, the less people will maintain their linguistic separateness if they're not tuned into each other uh, with affection. That makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. When you do idiolect, I'm going to I'm going to th- interview you, Paul. When you do idiolect work, do you ever work, uh, for example, on really specific idiolects of real people or composing from scratch an idiolect for a character? And what do you do when you are faced with a challenge of that sort? Well, I think I do both things. I think it's one can make inferences from the text of a play or a film that we're working on and make judgments about what that particular character's idiolect is likely to be based upon their aspirations, their professed, their observable aspirations, um, their, their observable value systems. So yes, we can we can extrapolate and, and infer from the text what what a person's idiolect may be. But then I also do the same thing with real life characters. I'm working with Golda's Balcony at the mm-hmm. moment, the uh, story of Golda Meir, and of course that's a real life character. And so, what can we observe about her aspirations to be Israeli rather than American? What does she want to convey about her value system, her education, her dovishness, her hawkishness? All of that can play into the speech style that we can observe. So it's it's interesting to talk with the actor about what we might learn from Golda Meir's idiolect. One of the things that I've become more and more interested in, dovetailing with what you're talking about, is working it the other way around. What happens if, in the case of a real-life person, what if we start with being as specific as possible about every single aspect of the idiolect? Mm -hmm. And what would that reveal to us about the person? I mean, as performers, later on, perhaps, the audience. So that if you have, for example, I have a checklist. This is a very small checklist. There's a lot more that can go into it. As with most accent and dialect work, I'm interested in resonance, which is also related to oral posture. And I may do some research into such a person's general dialect in the sense of where did they come from? What do we think we might be able to pick up? It's a shorthand. So-and-so is from Lubbock, Texas, What do I know about Lubbock, Texas accents? But then I have to match it against whether or not I'm hearing that in the actual speaker we're trying to model. And there are a whole lot of other features that really do make it idiolect. What is their pronunciation of specific words? Idiosyncratic pronunciations, idiosyncratic renderings of common idioms. Mm -hmm. What sort of tag words and phrases do they have? Where do they break up a sentence? Their own intonation, their own particular melody and rhythm, what tools they use to emphasize things, and also what sort of, we can call them impediments, but I would prefer to call them very individual features in this context. Do they lisp? Do they stutter or did they stutter? Do they wear false teeth? Did they used to wear braces? And all of these things, this level of gr- of granular detail goes into a speech pattern. And the closer you get to trying to fully embody another human being through their speech pattern, the more empathy you develop, at which point you are probably learning something about that person in a way that you could not do otherwise. Wonderful points. Wonderful points. I, while you were speaking, I flashed on the dilemma that often I have when 
receiving unsolicited submissions to IDEA. We encourage self-submissions in addition to people like you, our associate editors, who specifically choose people to interview and recordings to submit so that we have this wonderful archive of real-life dialects because often a self-submission, I might get a a self-submission from Lubbock, Texas, and it's so far away from the stereotype or the norm of a Lubbock, Texas accent that I'm faced with this dilemma. Even though the person grew up in Lubbock, Texas and has no other geographical influences on their speech, they have somehow rejected the norm that they were surrounded with as, a, as children and cultivated a style of speech, consciously or unconsciously, that doesn't represent that area. So should I put it in the archive? Well, it's, it's real. It's, there's, there's nothing unreal about it. There's nothing fake about it. It's representative of that area. But, but yet, from an actor's point of view, uh, how useful is it unless there are 30 or 40 other accents from Lubbock in the archive, which fortunately they might be. Again, it, it comes up against audience expectation, actor expectation. In terms of accepting that kind of submission, that kind of recording for idea, it's, it's often a uh, an interesting dilemma. I can well imagine. I would think if I were you, if I had this responsibility... I would probably not upload it till I had a sizable collection of samples that were more representative in general of the local speech pattern. And then I might upload it with some serious notes. Mm -hmm. And that's, in fact, what we do. And uh, fortunately, the, the archive is now so large, having been going for more than 20 years with over 100 associate editors like you, So we have, there are many, many regions of the world that probably have more samples than we need. So we can begin to accept those that are not typical. So that's a nice problem to have. It's a wonderful problem to have, and I congratulate you. So before we wrap up, is there any topic you'd like to touch on? Well, I think rolling back to something you said earlier, you were talking about um, the responsibility that we might take on as dialect coaches for more sympathy and more honor and more respect in our work as dialect coaches generally. I do think that really submerging oneself into a highly, highly detailed process, such as I outlined just a little while ago, enables us to do that work and to perhaps be less judgmental, more empathetic, and more interested in honoring still further the authentic speech of people from a certain background or in a certain community who are being represented in a play or in a film or on a television show or in new media. There are sometimes roadblocks to that, which can include lack of interest on the part of a director or producer in that level of work. But I think it's our responsibility to fight for it as much as we can, consistent with the stated needs of a production. You know, Amy, that's the most articulate and beautiful and noble description of the job that you and I are proud to call our vocation. Thanks for talking to me today. It's been a real pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And thanks to you for joining Amy and me. Join me next time when my guest will be my longtime colleague, Linda Nichols Gidley, one of Australia's most successful dialect coaches. During her tenure at the National Institute of Dramatic Art, NIDA, in Sydney, it was my pleasure to give an annual masterclass to her dialect class. Her actors were always hugely talented, being the cream of Australia's acting talent, and Linda's training was impeccable. Tony Collette, Hugh Jackman and Kate Blanchett are just three of that school's celebrated alumni, by the way. Linda and I will be talking about Strine. Australian, that is. Australian English in all its richness. 
I'm sure we'll talk about Australian movies and film actors and why Aussie actors are so good at American and British accents. So I'll be saying good night, mate, to Linda Nichols Gidley next time on In a Manner of Speaking. <laughs>